something right now that we haven't done at this convention for I don't know how many years, Devon. Quite a while. Uh, Jeff Hanlon, I believe, was the last uh, FFA national officer that we had here, and that was, I believe, about 12 years ago. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce a young gentleman to you. Comes from the good country, Illinois. I can get away with that, Bob. He's a gentleman that spoke at our Illinois NFO convention a couple uh, this year before last when he was state president. He's now the national secretary of the FFA, an organization of about a half a million young men and women, and he is one of the six national officers. So he is indeed an outstanding individual. And at this time, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Bob Quick on his first official assignment of having just been recently elected to National Secretary of the Future Farmers of America. I believe in the future of farming with the faith born not of words, but of deeds. Achievements won by the present and past generations of agriculturalists and the promise of better days through better ways, even as the better things we now enjoy have come to us from the struggles of former years. As I start, I pronounce to you the first paragraph of the FFA Creed that E.M. Tiffany so well and so ingeniously put together back in 1930 for the FFA members. And for the past eight years of my FFA career, that first paragraph of that creed has had a lot of meaning because I am also an agriculturalist coming from a small production farm. And today I'm no more than just an FFA member and I would like to, on that behalf, bring the greetings of some 481,000 FFA members to you. And also say that on behalf of the five national officers in which I had the opportunity to serve on their team with, they bring their greetings and regret that they couldn't be here with you. But as I go back, I think of that FFA creed, and I'm sure the other FFA members are thinking of that also, because that creed has so much meaning to us because we're talking about farming and we're young agriculturalists and we have that belief that there is always going to be the industry of agriculture and that it's going to grow and grow and become so much more important as we produce the food and fiber for the world. Not only for the United States but for the world and we're going to take such a even more dramatic role in producing the food and fiber that you have not even seen to this point of this day. When I think of agriculture, I think of a lot of responsibility that a small segment of our population has. Only 3% and even less than 3% today are the agriculturalists of the United States and they provide the food and fiber for America and for the world. Only 3% of the U.S. population, some 250 million people, and only 3% of the people have the responsibility of pr producing the food and fiber. You have a lot to be proud of, but one thing that I see as a young individual, and that's that the American farmer sometimes forgets the big basic role that you provide in the world today. You forget that. I think you put it back subconsciously and you forget that big important role because you're so busy working. And I just want to go back and kind of hit some of the things that you as an American, <clears throat> excuse me, as an American farmer do for the world. The U.S. agriculture industry is the world's basic industry. It's the biggest industry in the United States, but not necessarily in every nation. But here in America, we have the resources, which is the land, labor, capital, and technology. But we have the American farmer. We have a, a man and a woman that are there that are capable of farming. They use every resource that they have, and they do it like it's never been done before. And they put together the biggest, the strongest, industry ever known. The American agriculture industry holds the key to development of many other industries. 
You're the reason why we have a lot of employed people in America. Because the agriculture industry is so big, the processing that is needed for the grain that we produce, for the livestock that we produce, is so large. We have the amazing abilities of the American farmer to produce annually, to produce higher yields on fewer acres, and there is no other country in the world that can brag and boast that other than the United States. We're the leading exporter of agricultural products. And when you talk about being the leading agricultural exporter, you've also got to say that we play a big role in the economy, in the economy which touches everyone's lives here in America. Because the American farmer, we can narrow that deficit in our trading balance. And the thing of that is we're the leading exporter and we haven't even touched the top of the surface. We haven't even skimmed the, skimmed the surface as to the production that we are capable of producing. We haven't even reached our potential yet. We've just barely found it. And with research and with technology, I'm sure we're going to find that in the years ahead. In America, we allow consumers to enjoy more ample supply of food, nutritious food, and wholesome food products. And at sound prices like in no other country in the world. We spend less than 16% of our total disposable income for food. And that allows a higher standard of living because other individuals, because the individuals of America can go back and can buy those products that they, know they so necessarily need. Not only is the American farmer a producer, a man that has worked hard, but he's also a consumer. And that's also a good advantage that we have. Because no matter what we produce, we've always got to keep in mind that we're consumers, and I think a lot of people forget about that. The American farmer is also an individual not suspicious of new ways and of trying new things, new ideas. But whenever new ideas come out which we think are beneficial, we use them. And we're not leery of it. We have no skepticism because of that. The American farmer is a man capable of so much, and he provides so much because the strength that he has of his will. Because if you look today, and I can speak very clearly, because as a young individual, all I hear of the American farm industry is negative from outside people. It's negative because they say there is no future in farming, and that is not so. Even for the young people, which I can speak on their behalf, they say there is no future for the young people in agriculture, and that is not so. But I can say one thing for the American agriculture industry that I th think speaks so well, and I can say this for any industry in America. The attitude that you've got to have to be an American farmer, to be an American agriculturalist, is a positive attitude. And as long as you've got a positive attitude, as long as you have this basic understanding that nobody can stop you but you yourself, and that you can succeed and that you can become anybody you want to become, you can so become that. What a man thinketh in, it, thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if you want to become an American farmer, you can. And young people today can become American farmers. That's my dream, that's my goal, and I'm sure that one day I'll obtain that goal. But I will point this out. It will be hard to become an American farmer as a young individual. When you come from a small farm and the capital is not really there and the land is not there, but if I've got that in my heart, and I can tell you the young FFA members have that in their heart, they will one day become American farmers and agriculturalists. As we hear so many of the... <laughs> As I hear so much of the negative news, I kind of chuckle because I think it's people that don't really understand the agricultural industry. And that's all I can do is but chuckle. I believe that if I want to become a farmer, I can. And though, like you know better than I do, the challenges that face us are not negative, but they are positive. As I look ahead at the future, and people ask me many times, what is the one handicap that I see for the American agriculture industry? Or what could be the one handicap? And it's simply this, attitude. Because nobody can beat the American farmer but ourselves. In the years ahead, what is going to be the number one thing that we have to do it's going to be we have to learn to work cooperatively. We have to be more educated. We have to have a better knowledge of what we're doing. And that's going to come from sitting down and not just getting the education through schooling, but through practical experience. By reading magazines, newspapers, by keeping up to date, 
and by helping our farmers, our neighbors, our countrymen, helping each other out. And we can do that like no other industry can because we're capable of doing it, because we've done it so ingeniously for many years of the past, and we're going to continue to do it for the years ahead. The FFA is going to play a big role in that vital part of getting across to young people all about agriculture, and we've done that job since 1928, and we've done it in a very good way also. In America today, in FFA, not only do we try to provide the avenues through which FFA members, young individuals that have a lot of potential but don't know how to find that potential, not only do we help them reach their goals in just public speaking and parliamentary procedure and in record keeping, but we also teach them good ways of how you can become a better patriot of your country, of how you can become a better leader. And we try to teach the FFA member from way back, and it all starts with the family. FFA tries to teach the patriotism, the respect that you have to gain from that family. And the family is the most basic starting point of any young individual. And I hope that as I speak here today, you can understand, and if you have part of your family back home that couldn't make it, when you go back, you try to explain to them and that you try to be that good parent that they so much need. You've got to give your young individual a good family. And in America, we do have that family. And it is a great way to start. Also, the young people are taught through education. Not only in the FFA do we have just classroom instruction, but we're such a good organization because we also have the practical experiences by which you can learn through. Education is very important. And not only in agriculture today and in the FFA do we have the family and the education, but we have the practical experience. You learn by applying your talents and by reaching your potential in this manner. And one important thing that we need, and if I would have to say one important thing you're going to have to do for the young people, not only in FFA, but the many other young organizations, youth organizations, is you're going to have to help advise them. Though we try our hearts out many times, we can also spin our shoes a little bit and not make it too far because we don't have the advice. You've got the experience that we don't have, and we need that advice so desperately. We need your help. We need your support. And you've got to understand the young individual wants to grow and wants to prosper, but without your help, we can't go too far because we don't really have much of a past to look back to, and you do, because you've experienced a lot of agony, a lot of struggles, and you've faced a lot of challenges, and you know what it's like back there. And you've got to help the young people like never before to face the challenges that we're going to be facing in the years ahead. In the years ahead, the American farmer will be producing more food and fiber than for just 56 individuals which we produce today. The American farmer will have to have more knowledge than just in the areas of business when and which you're a businessman of labor and management. You're also the chief purchasing agent. You have to decide which twenty or $80,000 combine to buy. You're also an efficiency expert, and in, a, and in an area in which the rate of return is so minimal, you have to know where you can find that extra dollar. You have to also be an environmentalist and a conservationist. And most of all, the American farmer, you have to become an optimist. You are an optimist, and you've got to remain that way. And you've got to spread all this knowledge down to those many FFA members. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in America today, there's an army moving in. There is an army moving in, and they're taking over the agriculture industry. They've already taken over the transportation industry, the shipping lanes that we have. These people are moving into the United States like you've never seen before, and they're taking over our total economy like never before. And many of you are probably starting to get a little nervous, and you're probably starting to shake a little bit, and you're thinking, who is this army that's moving in? Are they from the other part of the world that we fight, it seems like, all the time? No. Because this army that I'm talking about, that I've been talking about for the past few minutes, is the young people, the young, aggressive individual who wants to prosper, and who will prosper in the years ahead. But as I again relate, it's going to come from the family, the education, the experience, and the advice that you can give to us, the young people of America. And I also hope that in what I've said today that you can understand the important role that you play in agriculture. It's not by no means small, but it is large. The American farmer has a large role which you have to maintain and support. The basic downfall to agriculture, which will never come, but if it would come, it would be because we don't have the attitude to, to keep facing the challenges that lie ahead. We've got to face those challenges, and we will. 
you look at the economy today, things look bad for the American producer. The government, sometimes we say their interference is really hurting us. But keep in mind, the only thing that can hurt the American farmer is our own attitude when we learn not to work cooperatively, when we, when we just throw in the towel. And we can't do that, and we won't do that. The past, we started out with a 100-horse team. We had 100 horsepower to pull our machines way, way, way back. And even before that, all we had was a hoe. And when you look ahead to the future, one day we're going to be farming out of control tires because we're already doing it. Down in Mississippi in a junior college, they're already farming through a control tire with underground wires, and there is not one man sitting on the tractor, but he's sitting up in a control, control tire running that enterprise. And also in the future, you're going to have management, and it's going to be so necessary, you're going to have to become an even better manager. You're going to have to become even a better efficiency expert. But we've already started doing that because that's what we're training the young people to do. But you're going to have to start doing that more so every day now today. And I guess the best day that I haven't talked about yet, I've talked about the past, the future so briefly, but the most important day is today. Because if we wait till tomorrow, we will never realize and understand the potential that we have in our industry. It's a great industry. We've got a lot of potential. And you as the American farmer have not even reached the potential. You haven't even skimmed the surface. You have not even began to realize the full potential that you have as an American individual. And I hope that you will. I want to leave you with a little story that it means an awful lot to me, and I hope that you'll listen very closely as I say it. There was once a young married couple living in a nice home. It was very small and comfortable for their salary and their, their living conditions. And one day, the lady noticed that they had a mouse running loose in the house. And so she wisely told her husband, who I think was just as much as scared, gentlemen, I think he was also scared, that he needed to buy a mouse trap. So this man thought, well, fine. And he kind of wasted a little time during the day. And finally that night, he went out to a hardware store and he bought a mouse trap. And that night, he brought it back and he started to set it up. And he realized that he needed some type of bait for that mouse. And he went to the refrigerator, and he looked completely through that refrigerator, and he couldn't find any bait at all, no cheese or nothing that he could plan as, as a, a bait or an incentive for that mouse to come to that trap. So he got to thinking, and he thought for a couple hours. It was getting late, and he wanted to go to, to bed, and he was tired. So he thought, well, what am I doing? So he went over to a magazine, and he cut out the picture of a piece of cheese, and he put that on that mouse trap. Well, he went to bed that night, and when he got up the next morning, do you know what he caught? And he caught the picture of a mouse. <laughs> and <laughs> and that's the only to say to the agricultural leaders of America, when you start, start to set your trap and, and you don't have any bait, just to think about the potential that you have, you've got to be realistic in your goals and in your dreams and your, in your desires. You have the biggest industry in the world and be realistic about that because I'm sure that if you put the picture of a piece of cheese in your mouse trap, you'll catch the picture of a mouse and you'll never really catch the realistic values of life. Be realistic in every walk of your life. And as the last paragraph of the Future Farmers of America Creed says, I believe that rural America can and will hold true to the best traditions of, its national, of our national life and that I can exert an influence in my home and community that will stand solid for my part and aspiring task. Go back to your communities. Go back to your communities when you leave the conference, this convention of the NFO, and try to instill in the young people and in your neighbors alike and try to help them understand the great potential and the great need we have in your industry so that they'll realize the values that they must have in being realistic with themselves and in the world tomorrow. Thank you very much on behalf of the FFA. We appreciate this opportunity. And I must say that this happens to be one of the happiest times in my life because not only is it the first time, my first uh, experience as a national officer, but I've had the opportunity with the NFO back in Illinois. And I understand your purposes, your principles, and I say more power to you, and I wish you the best in the years to come because the American farmer has the greatest 
and the brightest future ever known yet, and it's yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. The secretary <coughs> has arrived, and it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce the Honorable Secretary of Agriculture to the delegate body. And as his close personal friends know, he's a farmer from Roseau, Minnesota, first, and then secondly, a politician. He's been a member of the National Farmers Organization for many, many years, and he is a graduate from the University of Minnesota, majoring in agriculture. Bob was elected three times to the United States Congress from the 7th District of Minnesota, and interestingly enough, he's the first Secretary of Agriculture who is a real farmer since the Roosevelt administration. And we appreciate the open-door policy that he has always had. Merely with a phone call or a need, we had access to he and his staff over the past four years, and we appreciate that interest and that cooperation. Bob recognized some time ago that we did not really have an effective farm organization or farm program. And so he became involved in using his influence in both, assisting farm organizations and designing a farm program, and hence the structure meetings that you became aware of was under his direction in a desire to redirect and better serve the needs of farmers. Bob's a team man, and he served as a member of the president's cabinet. Let me introduce to you the Honorable Secretary, Bob Berglund. Mr. President, officers, Delegates, fellow members, guests, and friends all. It is an honor for me to be invited to this convention, one of the most important agriculture events each year in these United States. I'm here this morning um, primarily to discuss with you the role uh, not of agriculture in this world uh, because I think that has been well established, but rather the role of institutions in strengthening the structure of agriculture in the United States as these changes come about. And to thank you and your leaders for the constructive help which you've given me and my colleagues during these past four years. There have been times when uh, we have disagreed as it should be. In an open and free society, it is necessary that people take time out from their routine to take stock and think and organize and represent yourself and your views in the halls of the Congress of the United States or the legislature, in the Department of Agriculture, and most importantly, at the marketplace. 
And during these, during these past four years, we have gone through turbulent times. In this world that is getting smaller as airplanes get faster, an imperfect world, an unruly place, a world driven sometimes by persons like the Ayatollah Khomeini, persons that we don't understand, persons we don't even know, who go to a different church, who dress differently, who don't speak our language, different values, a different culture. Persons like the Ayatollah Khomeini come and go, but they have today a profound impact upon the United States, upon you and me, individually and as an organization. And so we have gone through four years of uh, difficulty. Soviet invasion of Afghanistan brought an embargo, creating a great deal of uncertainty and anxiety. But all during this time, you, uh, through your chosen officials at the state and national level, have constantly represented a solid, substantial, continuing source of strength and support for this government. Critical at times, of course, as it should be, but always there to be counted on, even when the going was rough. We could depend on you as having the courage of your convictions and the capacity to think clearly, and your leaders have the skills to represent those viewpoints even under difficult times. We're now in the transitional phase of transferring power from one administration to the next. Nobody's being shot. No one is going to jail. And I just uh, met uh, yesterday with uh, some officials from China discussing uh, the future of our two countries in our agricultural trade, and they marveled at how we in the United States could contest the election as bitterly as this one was fought out. That we choose our leaders, but once the election is over, we unite because we are, above all else, Americans first. And as we read uh, the headlines and watch the national news and see the unrest in places like Poland, it should serve to reinforce a conviction that we sometimes take for granted, namely that the freedom to criticize government, the freedom to organize, the freedom to bargain collectively is a freedom that has been taken for granted but must be protected at almost any cost. And there are some persons who think they're responsible for the outcome of this election who would destroy those freedoms if they get their way, be on guard. But while government changes in a peaceful fashion, and we are having a reasonable transfer of power. I am not here today to discuss what the incoming administration or the new Senate Republicans might do in the agricultural front because it would be unfair of me. Time will tell. But the transfer is going on in an orderly fashion. It should be, however, also a reminder that elections replace people like me and Jimmy Carter and members of the Congress of the United States and governors and all. And those elections, therefore, will change policies, as policies have changed from time to time, reinforcing, therefore, the need for organizing in the private market sector, such as is the creed of the NFO.
You cannot depend on government to provide you the kind of income you deserve. You've got to use the enormous economic and political power in your hands to advance your cause as a, an organized part of this free society. And you know how to do it. You've had experience at it. I've been a member since NFO was organized in my county in the 1960s. And I know. I know how difficult it is. I know how complicated and how discouraging it can be at times. But I also know this. It's the best hope. And so just keep at it. Now, I'm going to be leaving my job in a couple of months, but I'm not going to get off the world. I'm going to be around in some capacity, be doing something. I don't know where and I don't know what, but you can be assured that I'm going to maintain my keen interest in the affairs of agriculture and family farming and uh, indeed um, the whole matter of this um, tremendously important industry.